It was on a day not unlike this one. It was cold, it was windy, and it was the beginning. It was the beginning of the Great Crusade. D-Day, June 6, 1944, the Allied invasion of Europe. Dwight David Eisenhower, Supreme Allied Commander and an NRA member, commanded troops from 14 nations. And his job and their job was to bring about the destruction of the Nazi war machine. And it was at places like this, Utah Beach, at Bloody Omaha, at Sword and Gold Beaches, and at Juneau, that Allied assault troops came ashore and engaged in combat with the enemy. June 6, 1944 was the beginning of the end for Nazi Germany. The U.S. Army 7th Corps was designated to land on a beach that we now know as Utah Beach. The 7th Corps consisted of multiple divisions. It was a force of approaching 50,000 Americans with the Spearhead Division being 4th Infantry Division and the follow-on division being the 90th Infantry Division. This force would conduct the landing, then move into the interior, link up with the two airborne divisions, then drive westward to cut off the peninsula with the hopes then that follow-on units could move north to attack and liberate the port at Cherbourg. The U.S. Army 7th Corps landings on Utah Beach undergo some pretty dynamic and interesting complications in action on June 6th. It all starts when the landings begin at the wrong place. Utah Beach is an example of the fog of war, the friction of war, not necessarily affecting the outcome. All the logistics and planning had been predicated on landing at a specific spot. But with the 4th Division coming ashore where they did, they encountered less resistance. And the men and tanks of the 4th and of the 70th Tank Battalion were able to get inland more quickly, which made a huge difference for the men defending places like La Fiere and, of course, St. Mariglis. Utah Beach uh, doesn't get the, uh, the press that Omaha Beach gets uh, because the casualties were significantly less there. The fourth U.S. Fourth Division uh, came ashore there, but they were supported in depth with the 82nd and the 101st Airborne Divisions, which had landed there earlier in the morning. So you had the Germans in a great state of confusion uh, because they had the enemy in front and behind them, and scattered all throughout behind them. So it paralyzed their their rear lines efficiently and very effectively real early on. There's this really fascinating little vignette that plays out on the beach where you have a regimental commander and battalion commanders that have made it to the beach and they're examining a map. They have just discovered that they've landed at the wrong place. And the 4th Infantry Division's assistant division commander, a man by the name of Theodore Roosevelt Jr., stumbles up to the scene. He finds them there. He asks Colonel James Van Fleet what's going on. Van Fleet then explains to him, we've landed at the wrong place. We're a mile south of where we're supposed to be. Roosevelt asks him, what is it that you propose to do? And he said, we're just discussing the plan of getting the men back on the landing craft to go back up and conduct a second landing where we're supposed to be. And Roosevelt, in response to that, says, to hell with that. We start the war right here. Roosevelt's leadership here on Utah Beach at the critical moment when other commanders were considering putting the men back on the landing craft. It, it sets a tone. With him coming onto the scene, with him taking over and issuing this centrally important command, the 4th Infantry Division begins pushing into the interior from this spot. It paves the way for other 7th Corps units to land here, push into the interior. They have to tackle other complicating factors and difficulties, but that ultimately leads them to success. And had Roosevelt's leadership not occurred at this spot, it could have resulted in a higher loss of life. And Roosevelt's critical leadership ultimately results in him being awarded the Medal of Honor. And that leadership begins right at this spot in the early hours of D-Day. The 
purpose of landing an entire U.S. Army Corps on this, the east coast of the Cochetin Peninsula, was to secure the far right flank of the Allied invasion in Normandy. By putting 7th Corps here, they would cut across the peninsula to isolate the German port city at Cherbourg. We also put two airborne divisions in the interior, the 101st Airborne Division a little bit close into the beach, the 82nd Airborne Division a little bit farther away. And by landing here, 7th Corps would push into the interior, cross over a series of beach exits. These beach exits were solid roadways leading across the marshy area just inland, just beyond the dunes on Utah Beach. By securing these beach exits, it would make it possible for the mechanized fighting force that was the U.S. Army 7th Corps to move into the interior, link up with the 101st Airborne Division, link up with the 82nd Airborne Division, and then continue the drive westward to cut off the Cotentin Peninsula. The environment in the interior in the American area, the areas behind Utah Beach and Omaha Beach, it's an area that's dominated by a central feature, and that's the hedgerows. Over centuries, the French allowed hedgerows to grow. The result is that as our fighting forces began to move into the fighting environment, especially behind Utah Beach, they're moving into an area that is crisscrossed by intense hedgerows. What it does is it creates a battle in microcosm. It encapsulates battlefields, which then boils the entire confrontation down to man on man, German soldier, American soldier, fighting with infantry small arms. So as the men of the 4th Infantry Division came ashore, they were facing the German beach defenses, of course, but also German small arms. The standard light machine guns of the German army were the MG42 and the MG34. The MG34 was a radical gun when it was adopted in 1934, and it was one of the first true general purpose machine guns. It could be used on a tripod or it could be used on a bipod. It was air-cooled and fed from a metal belt. The Germans had a completely different tactical attitude toward infantry uh, light machine guns and rifles. Uh, the killing machine, in their view, was the machine gun. And the soldiers were there, really, with bolt-action rifles to protect the machine gun. That was their job. By 1944, we had developed a basic tactic, and that was that the suppressed fire or base of fire element in an American infantry squad was typically a belt-fed machine gun, either the M1919A4 or the M1917A1 water-cooled. And then the maneuver element or kill element within a squad or platoon were riflemen equipped with the eight-shot M1 rifle. This differs a little bit from the German approach. Utah Beach is quite well documented during the invasion. There are army photographers that are here and they snap some memorable images of this location as troops of the 7th Corps are piling ashore. In fact, there's this one well-known image that I'm quite fond of that was taken just on the other side of these dunes where a machine gun section from 4th Division, they've come off the, of their landing craft, they are going over the dunes. You can see where engineers have marked an area clear of landmines. And with this heavy machine gun section, you see one man on his shoulder. He has the M1917A1 tripod over his shoulders. And that's nothing to sneeze at because the tripod itself is 65 pounds. And the fact that this firearm is present here, conspicuously present, showing up over and over again in the photographs in the campaign that follows in the hedgerows of the Cotentin Peninsula, it indicates the continuing importance of the 1917A1 machine gun. We sometimes, by this stage of World War II, think that the M1919A4 air-cooled machine gun is being used more broadly. But in this campaign, M1917A1 heavy machine guns appear in the photography and the film footage over and over again, testifying to the fact that that firearm was still centrally important to the firepower that American maneuver battalions were bringing to the battlefield.